the Summer Theater. Welcome to the Summer Theater, dramatic hour of romance, love, and adventure. Tonight, we present Moliere's classic play, The Physician in Spite of Himself, starring Mr. Robert Young. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your host, Don Wilson. Tonight, we're presenting a farce comedy that was written, believe it or not, almost 300 years ago, and has since played almost continuously to delighted audience throughout the entire world. But as it was written so long ago, the characters in it speak differently from the way we do. They say the same, same things we might say, and certainly feel as we do, for none of that has changed, but they don't quite sound like us. For this reason, we have secured the services of a narrator for you a man who will help tell the story and set the scenes. And now I'm going to ask him to take over as the Summer Theater brings you The Physician in Spite of Himself by the great French playwright Moliere. Our star is Mr. Robert Young. Good evening. I am your narrator, and we're ready to begin our story. The time, as you already know, is long, long ago. The year 1666, to be exact. The scene is the backyard of Monsieur Scannerel, our hero's house in a small French village near a small French forest. The house is a simple one, for Monsieur Scannerel is not a wealthy man. But he is a healthy and vigorous one, and not bad-looking at all. He lives there with his wife, whose name is Martine. And as so often happens between husbands and wives, even as long ago as 1666, they engage in an occasional lover's spat. <laughs> well, Scannerelle and Martine seem so engaged right now. <laughs> the quarrel is violent only because they love each other so. Ah, here comes Scannerell now, bursting out the back door of his house, followed by his charming and understanding wife, Martine. Uh, listen. No, I tell you that I will do nothing of the kind and that it is for me to speak and be master. And I tell you that I will have you live as I like and that I am not married to you to put up with your vagaries. Oh, what a nuisance it is to have a wife. And Aristotle is perfectly right in saying that a woman is worse than a demon. Look at Master Clever with his silly Aristotle. Yes, Master Clever. Find me another log binder who can argue upon things as I can and who has served a famous physician for six years, and who, when only a boy, knew his grammar by heart. Plague on the errant fool. Plague on the witch. Cursed be the hour and the day when I took it into my head to say yes. Cursed be the scoundrel of a notary that made me sign my own ruination. Oh, certainly it well becomes you to complain on that score. Ought you not rather to thank heaven every minute of the day that you have me for a wife? Yeah. And did you deserve to marry a woman like me? It is true you do me too much honor. Now enough. Let us drop the subject. I must go. Aha! You wish to drop it. You, a fellow who will drive me to the hospital. A debauched, deceitful wretch who gobbles up every farthing I have got. That is a lie. For I drink part of it. <laughs> who sells piecemeal every stick of furniture in the house. That is living upon one's means. <sighs> who has taken the very bed from under me. You will get up earlier in the morning. <laughs> In short, who does not leave me a stick in the whole house? There will be the less trouble in moving. Oh. And who from morning to night does nothing but gamble and drink? That is done in order not to get in the dumps. <laughs> and what am I to do all the while with my family? Whatever you like. I have four poor children on my hands. Put them down. <laughs> who keep asking? 
asking me every moment for bread. Whip them. When I have had enough to eat and drink, everyone in the house ought to be satisfied. And do you mean to tell me, you sot, that things can always go on so? Wife, let us proceed gently, if you please. That I am to bear forever with your insolence and your debauchery? Do not let us get into a passion, wife. And that I do not know the way to bring you back to your duty? Wife, you know that I am not a very patient man and that my arm is somewhat heavy. I laugh at your threats. My sweet wife, my pet. Your skin is itching, as usual. Mm, I will let you see that I am not afraid of you. My dearest rib, you have set your heart upon a thrashing. Do you think that I am frightened at your talk? Sweet object of my affections, I shall box your ears for you. Sock that you are. I shall thrash you. Walking wine cast. I shall pummel you. Infamous wretch. I shall curry your skin for you. Wretch, villain, deceiver, cur, scoundrel, churl, rogue, scamp, thief. You will have it, will you? <gasps> oh, put that stick down. Help! So now, ladies and gentlemen, it must be reported that Monsieur Scannerell, our hero, holds a stout stick, and with every gesture indicates he is going to beat his poor, timid wife. Now, beating a wife was more in fashion in 1666 than it is today, but I am not here to argue the relative merits of our ways and theirs, only to tell you that right now a man is looking over the fence, watching Scannerell waving the stick. The man is the next door neighbor. His name is Monsieur Robert, and he is about to do something that many of our neighbors today would feel obliged to do, but in. Hello, hello, what is this? Hmm? Ah, oh, good day, Monsieur Robert. What a disgraceful thing this is, Scannerell. Plague, take the scamp to beat his wife. What did you say, Robert? I said, Plague, take the scamp to beat his wife. Plague take him, you say? How dare you? You slapped me. And should I not? What are you interfering with? Were... Oh, just look at this jack and apes who wishes to hinder husbands from beating their wives. <laughs> I apologize. Is it for you, Robert, to poke your nose into it? No. Mind your own business. I shall not say another word. It pleases me to be beaten. In that case, I consent with all my heart. It does not hurt you. That is true. You are an ass to interfere with what does not concern you. Neighbor Scannerell. Yes? I ask your pardon with all my heart. Go on, thrash and beat your wife as much as you like. I shall help you if you wish. <laughs> Put down that stick. Huh? I do not want your help. Exactly so. It is like your impertinence to meddle with other people's business. Now put down your stick. I shall. Good. <clears throat> oh! Ah, stop! Stop! Away! Away with you, you meddling fool! Yes, yes, I can well see my error. <sighs> He's gone, wife. My sweet, my precious. The busybody. Come, Angel, let us make up. Shake hands. After having beaten me thus? Never mind that. Shake hands. I will not. Eh? And do not raise your stick to me. Come, wife. No. I will be angry. But it's a trifle. Shake hands, I tell you. You have treated me too ill. Well, I beg your pardon. Put your hand there and forgive me. I forgive you. But I shall make him pay for it. He shall see. You are silly to take notice of these trifles. They are necessary now and then to keep up good feeling. Five or six strokes of the cudgel between people who love each other only brighten the affections. I'm going to the forest, and I promise you I shall bring out more than a hundred logs today. That will please you? Yes. A kiss? A kiss. I shall go now, my love, and put in a day's work. Scannerell bends, picks up his sack and axe, and with a wave to his beloved Martine, trudges off to the nearby forest to cut his logs. And Scannerell is quite content that all is once again harmonious between him and his wife. Ah, but is it? A peculiar look crosses Martine's face as she gazes after the retreating figure of her husband. Now she glances down at the stick he raised to her. Hmm. It seems quite clear her feminine mind still dwells on the beating. Alone now, she speaks her thoughts. Hmm. Go cut your logs, my husband. But I certainly shall not forget to pay you out. Oh, if I could only think of something to punish you for the blows you gave me. Ah, I want revenge that will strike home, or it will not be satisfaction for the insult which I have received. Revenge, of course. 
How like a wife in those primitive years of 1666. <laughs> now, two strangers approach, walking wearily up the street. They stop by the back fence, within a few yards of Martine, and slump down in the dirt to rest. These men are servants. Their names are Lucas and Valère, and one can see that they are troubled. At first, Martine doesn't see them as they talk together, discussing their strange problem. Oh, Valère, we have truly undertaken a curious errand, and I do not for my part know what we shall get by it. Uh, what is the use of grumbling, Lucas? We are bound to do as our master tells us. True. Besides, we both have some interest in the health of his daughter. For her marriage, which is put off through her illness, will no doubt bring us in something. Ah, it shall. Horace, who was generous, is the most likely to succeed among her suitors. Mm. Although she has shown some inclination for a certain Leon. Ah, but you know well enough that her father would never consent to receive Leandre for a son-in-law. Never. Horace he wants and Horace he will have, no matter what his daughter's wishes are. Martine turns her head and sees the two servants sitting by her fence. She looks at them a moment, then walks over to them, and listen carefully, ladies and gentlemen, for the plot is about to thicken. Gentlemen? Uh -huh. mm, good day, gentlemen. I did not notice you resting here at first, for my brain was puzzled about something that perplexes me. Good day to you, madame. Yes, everyone has his troubles in this world, and we are looking for something we should be very glad to find. Mm. Is it something in which I can assist? Perhaps. Oh, my name is Lucas, this is Valère. Madame? We are servants in the house of Gérard. He has sent us to find a clever man, some special physician, who can give relief to our master's daughter, seized with an illness which has deprived her of the use of her tongue. Her tongue? She cannot speak. Poor thing. Several physicians have already exhausted all their knowledge on her behalf. But sometimes one may find people with wonderful secrets and... Uh, Certain peculiar remedies, who very often succeed where others have failed. I see. Hmm. That is the sort of man we are looking for. Ha! This is an inspiration from heaven to revenge myself upon my rascal. Gentlemen, you could not have come to anyone better. Uh. We have a man here, the most wonderful fellow in the world for desperate maladies. Then tell us, where can we meet yes. him? Well, you will find him just now in the forest where he is amusing himself in cutting wood. A doctor who cuts wood? <laughs> he, he is a strange, eccentric, whimsical man whom you would never take to be what he really is. He, he goes about dressed in the most extraordinary fashion, pretends sometimes to be very ignorant and keeps his knowledge to himself. Astounding. And dislikes nothing so much as using the marvelous talents which heaven has given him for the healing art. Madame, it is a wonderful thing that all these great men have always some slight grain of madness mixed with their learning. Oh, the madness of this man is greater than can be imagined. For uh, sometimes, sometimes he has to be beaten before he will admit his ability. No. Uh, beaten, you say? Beaten, truly. So I warn you beforehand <laughs> that he will never admit that he is a physician unless you each take a stick and compel him by dint of blows to concede at last what he will conceal at first. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> it is thus that we act when we have need of him. Oh, but you will see that he works wonders. What is his name, madame? His name is Scannerell. It is easy to recognize him. He wears a rough and a, and a yellow and a green coat. A yellow and a green coat? Uh, he is then a parrot doctor? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> madame. Is it true he is as clever as you say? Oh, as clever. He is a man who works miracles. About six months ago, a woman was given up as dead by all physicians. Uh -huh. They were going to bury her when they dragged by force the physician Scannerell to her bedside. Oh. Having seen her, he poured a small drop of something in her mouth. Ah, uh, yes. At mm -hmm. that very instant, she rose from mm. her bed and began immediately to walk into her room as if nothing had happened. Oh. Ah. ah! Not more than three weeks ago, a young child fell from the top of the belfry. Ah. No sooner than they took our man to it, than he rubbed the whole body with a certain ointment, which he alone knows how to prepare, and the child immediately rose and ran away to play. Aha! Oh. Uh -huh. 
This man must have the universal cure-all. Who doubts it? Odds, Bobs, he's the very man we want. Uh, come, Lucas, let us go quickly and fetch him. Uh, but, but do not fail to remember the warning I have given you. Leave it to us. If he wants nothing more than a thrashing, we will gain our point. <laughs> And so Scannerell's adoring wife, Martine, has cleverly set her revenge in motion. Now let us jump on ahead and find her unsuspecting husband. This is the forest near the Scannerell home, heavily wooded and alive with many 17th century French birds and insects. Our hero is around here someplace. Ah, there he is, working himself into a sweat chopping wood with great gusto. Why? <laughs> Already he's cut one whole log and he's been at it only half an hour. He chops. He stops. And again he chops. <laughs> again he stops. Sets down his axe and rests. For a married man with a family to support must be careful not to work himself into exhaustion. <laughs> now Scannerell puts his hand into his sack and takes something out. <laughs> it looks suspiciously like a bottle. Zounds, I've done enough to deserve a drink. One must take all care not to let work give one the blues. Ah, you rogue. I love you. I love you, my pretty dear bottle. Now, while Monsieur Scannerell is occupied enjoying a mild refreshment, Lucas and Valère, the two servants in search of a physician, come into the clearing. They stop and look at Monsieur Scannerell a few paces from them. He is surely our man, Valère. Exactly as described to us by the good woman. Well, come on, Lucas. Let us go to him. Hello, sir. Huh? <clears throat> good day to you, sir. Good day to you. Uh, sir, is not your name Scannerell? Yes and no. It depends on what you want with him. Well, we want nothing with him but to offer him our utmost civilities. In that case, my name is Scannerell. Delighted to see you, sir. We have been recommended to you and come to implore your help. If it be anything, gentlemen, that belongs to my little trade, I am quite ready to oblige you. Well, you must not think it strange, sir, that we have addressed ourselves to you. Clever people are always much sought after, and we have been informed of your capacity. It is true, gentlemen, that I am the best hand in the world at chopping logs. Oh, I spare sir. no pains and make them in the best fashion. But I charge 110 sous a hundred. Let us not speak about it. I logs. pledge my word that I could not sell them for less. You may find some elsewhere for less, but there be logs and logs. I pray you, sir, let us change the conversation. I take my oath that you shall not have them for less. Upon my word, you shall pay the price. Ought a gentleman like you, sir, to amuse himself with these clumsy pretenses, to lower himself to talk thus? Hmm? Ought so learned a man, such a famous physician as you, wish to disguise himself as a woodchopper? and keep buried his great talents? This fellow is mad. <laughs> All this beating about the bush is useless. We know what we know. <laughs> what do you know? For whom do you take me? For what you are, a great physician. Physician yourself. 
I am not one, and I have never been one. Uh, Lucas, the fit is on him. Fit? Sir, do not deny things any longer. And do not, if you please, make us have recourse to uh, unpleasant extremities. Sounds have recourse to whatever you like. I am not a physician, and I do not understand what you mean. Uh, Lucas, I perceive we shall have to apply the remedy. So it does seem. Once more, sir, I pray you, confess you are a physician. I tell you I am not a physician. You're not a physician? No. Well, since you will have it so, we must make up our minds to do it. That stick will do, Belair. Here. Now take one for yourself. Oh, I have one. <laughs> You're still not a physician, sir. No, I tell you. Very well. Oh, ow, uh, oh, 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 gentlemen, I will be anything you like. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> now, why? Why did you make us take the trouble of giving you such a beating? What does it all mean, gentlemen? Is it a joke, or are you both out of your minds to wish to make me out a physician? What, you do not give in yet? You still deny being a physician? The devil take me if I am one. Are you not a physician? No, plague choke me. This time, Lucas, he prefers choking to thrashing. <laughs> we must accommodate him. Oh, 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 oh. Yes, gentlemen, since you have it so, I am a physician. I am a physician. An apothecary into the bargain, if you like. Ah, that is better. I prefer saying yes to everything to being knocked about so. <laughs> that is right, sir. I am delighted to see you so reasonable. It does our hearts good, sir, to hear you speak truthfully at last. Bless <laughs> my soul. Am I perhaps myself mistaken? Have I become a physician without being aware of it? <laughs> Tell me, gentlemen, is it uh, quite certain that I am a physician? Oh, yes, upon my word. Really and truly? The cleverest physician in the world. Ha uh ha! -huh. A physician who's cured I do not know how many complaints. The dickens I had. A woman thought dead was ready to be buried when you, with a drop of something, brought her to again. The deuce I did. A child fell from a belfry top. And you, with I do not know what ointment, made her immediately get up on her feet and run off to play. The devil I did. <laughs> now, in short, sir, you will be satisfied with us. You shall earn whatever you like if you allow us to take you where we intend. I, uh, shall earn whatever I like? Yes. In that case, I am a physician. <laughs> <laughs> there is no doubt of it. I had forgotten it, but I recollect it now. Well, what is the matter? Where am I to go? We will conduct you. The matter is to see a girl who has lost her speech. Indeed, I've not found it. Odd <laughs> <laughs> Sniggers, oh, this is a physician I like, Lucas, for he is a comical fellow. <laughs> well, come along, gentlemen, so that I may get on to the task of performing more wondrous feats of healing of which I am justly famous. Oh, you first, sir. Thank you, my good man. And off through the forest go the three of them on their way to the home of Monsieur Geront. Through the trees and foliage they walk, Monsieur Scannerel striding with the dignity that befits a physician, and soon are lost from our sight. The end, act one. <laughs> Tomorrow night, 21st Precinct dramatizes another action story of the world's largest police force. Meet policemen as human beings. See them when they're in danger and also when they're out of harness, relaxing and being just plain guys. Every Tuesday night on most of these same CBS radio stations, see 21st Precinct produced by the same team that has given you gangbusters. <laughs> And now, act two of The Physician in Spite of Himself, starring Mr. Robert Young. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, this is your narrator to continue with the second act of The Physician in Spite of Himself. A half hour or so has passed. The scene now is a room in the home of Monsieur Geraint, the father of the girl who has lost her speech. And an elaborate room it is, too, filled with the finest drapery and furniture one could buy in 1666. 
for Monsieur Geront is one of the wealthiest men in the community. The door opens and Monsieur Geront comes in, a short, round man, well-dressed, but troubled now because of his daughter's illness. He is followed by his servant, Lucas, and Lucas' wife, Jacqueline, a comely, nicely formed woman who serves as the ill girl's nurse. Lucas is speaking with excited gestures, telling Monsieur Geront about the magnificent physician he has found. <laughs> Monsieur Geront, sir, I think you will be satisfied, for physician Sconarelle is the greatest in the world. Zooks, all the others aren't worthy to hold a candle to him. Oh, for better I could not ask. He's put dead people on their legs again. Dead people, you say? A physician of great reputation hereabouts. Though he is somewhat whimsical, as I have told you. At times his senses wander and he does not seem what he really is. One would have cause to say he has a screw loose somewhere. <laughs> a screw loose? Yes. But in reality, he's quite scientific. Very often he says things quite beyond anyone's comprehension. Oh, that is promising. Well, I'm anxious to see him. Bring him in. Valère is fetching him a physician's gown. He refused to see you without the proper garments. Properly so. Nurse Jacqueline, why do you frown? Upon my word, Monsieur Geraint, this physician will do just the same as all the rest. The best medicine to give your daughter would be a handsome, strapping husband for whom she could have some love. Hold your tongue, wife. It's not for you to poke your nose in here. I tell you that all these physicians do her no good. Your daughter, Monsieur Geraint, wants more than rhubarb and senna. A husband is a plaster that cures all girls' complaints. <laughs> Would any husband have her in her present state, Nurse Jacqueline, with that affliction upon her? And when I intended her to marry, has she not opposed my wishes? No wonder you wished her to marry a man whom she does not like. Why did you not give her Monsieur Leon, who takes her fancy? She would have been very obedient, and he would have taken her as she is. Leon is not the man I want. He's got no fortune, like Horace. He has an uncle who is rich, and Leon is the heir. All his expectations seem to me nothing but moonshine. We run a great risk in waiting for dead men's shoes. Death is not always at the beck and call of gentlemen heirs, and while the grass grows, the cow starves. Well, I would sooner give my daughter a husband she likes than have all the riches in the country. Bless my soul, Nurse Jacqueline, how you chatter. Now hold your tongue, you... The physician, Scannerell. The door opens wide and Monsieur Scannerell comes in dressed somewhat differently than before. Gone is his vibrantly yellow and green coat. He wears instead a long, flowing and sedate white gown of a physician. In his hand he holds a black pointed cap, a sign of scholarship. For a brief moment he surveys the room and the people before him. Then, and still with great dignity, he approaches Monsieur Geraint. Monsieur Geraint bows. Nurse Jacqueline curtsies. Scannerelle bows in return and, affecting his best bedside manner, speaks to Monsieur Geraint, a man he has not yet met. Sir, Hippocrates says uh, that we should both put our hats on. And Scannerelle plops his hat on his head. Hippocrates says that? Yes. In which chapter, if you please? In his chapter... Uh, on hats. Oh. <laughs> well, since Hippocrates says so, we must obey. Hand me my hat, Lucas. Thank you. Now, Doctor, having heard of the marvelous things... Uh, to whom are you speaking, Monsieur Scannerell? To you, Doctor. But I am not a physician. You are not a physician? Indeed, I am not. Really? Really. Lucas, good man, hand me that stick. Thank you. <laughs> now... Ah! Oh, oh! What are you doing? Why are you beating me? There! Now, you, sir, are a physician. <laughs> I myself have never taken any other degree. <laughs> Lucas, Lucas, what a devil of a fellow you've brought me here. Did I not tell you he was a funny sort of a physician? It is his joking. Well, his joking does not suit me. Monsieur Scannerelle, I am Monsieur Geront, father of the stricken girl. My pardon. Well, it's nothing. Now, to the matter at hand. My daughter, sir, is suffering from a strange complaint. I am delighted, Monsieur Geron, that your daughter has need of my skill. And I wish with all my heart that you stood in the same need of it. <laughs> I'm obliged to you for these kind feelings. Now, what is your daughter's name? Lucine. Lucine. Ah, what a pretty name. 
And who is this tall woman standing here? Monsieur. She is my daughter's nurse, Jacqueline. Deuce, that Jacqueline is a fine piece of household furniture. <laughs> <laughs> Our nurse, charming nurse. All my nostrums, all my skill, all my cleverness is at your service. Thank you, monsieur. Then by your leave, I embrace you, nurse, to show the depth of my sincerity. Mm, monsieur doctor. Oh, don't leave my wife alone, monsieur doctor. <laughs> what, Lucas? Is she your wife? Yes. I did not know. Hmm. Then I'm very glad of it, for the love of both of you. I congratulate her, Lucas, on having such a husband as you. Oh, thank you. And I congratulate you, Lucas, on having a wife so handsome, so discreet, and so well-shaped. <laughs> Once again, I embrace her to show the depth of my sincerity. Oh. Enough, enough. Do not be so sincere. Yes, enough indeed. <laughs> enough indeed, physician. Let us tend to the real patients. One moment, Monsieur Geron. Now that I'm here, I feel interested in your entire household. I should like to examine your nurse. No, nothing of the sort. I do not do it. <laughs> Calmly, Lucas. It is the physician's duty to examine the nurse, and she attends the patient. Duty or no duty, I, I will not have it. Have you the audacity to contradict a physician? Send him out, Monsieur Giron. I will not go, and I do not care a straw about a physician. Careful, I will give you a fever. <laughs> by my leave, by my leave, have done with this. The patient doctor, let us go to her. Very well, let us go. Come, nurse. I shall come too. Not so, Lucas, for while a doctor may well have need of a finely formed nurse, he certainly has no need of her husband. <laughs> This now before us, ladies and gentlemen, is Lucin's chamber, a large and pleasant place, done up as beautifully as a bedroom could be in the year 1666. The laces and silks are of the finest cloth, and the bed warming pan of the finest metal. Standing there by the window, gazing out at the afternoon sky, is a young and beautiful lady, Lucinde, of course, Geraint's daughter. But while physically she is here, her mind is far away, thinking of things most pleasant to every young and beautiful lady, love, and the object of her love, a certain handsome fellow called Leon. The door to the bedroom opens, Lucinde snaps out of her reverie, turns and sees the approach of her father, her nurse Jacqueline, and a stranger, who is, of course, our hero, Monsieur Scannerel, the physician. Here is the patient, Doctor. Ah, oh, charming and delightful creature. My only daughter, sir. I would never get over it if she were to die. Do not let her do anything of the kind. <laughs> she must not die without the prescription of the physician. <laughs> A chair, nurse. Bring it here. Yes, sir. Now come, my dear Lucinde, and let the physician attend to you. Hmm. This is not at all an unpleasant patient. And I'm of the opinion that she would not be at all amiss for a man in very good health. <laughs> oh, sir, you have made her laugh. So much the better. It is the best sign in the world when a physician makes a patient laugh. Lucinde, what is the matter? What ails you? <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I do not understand you, Lucid. Uh, what sort of language do you call that? Uh, that? That is just where the complaint lies, sir. She has become dumb without her having been able to discover the cause. This accident has obliged us to postpone her marriage to Monsieur Horace. And why so? Horace wishes to wait for her recovery to conclude the marriage. And who is this fool Horace that does not want his wife to be speechless? <laughs> Would to heaven that mine were thus. 
I should take particular care not to have her cured. To the point, sir. I beseech you to use all your skill to cure her of this affliction. Do not make yourself uneasy, Monsieur Geron. Now tell me, does this uh, pain oppress her much? Yes, sir. So much the better. Is the suffering very acute? Very acute. That is right. Now give me your hand, Lucien. Hmm. The pulse, Monsieur Geron, tells me that your daughter is dumb. Oh, sir, that is what is the matter with her. <laughs> Why, you have found it out at the first touch. Of course. <laughs> we great physicians, we know matters at once. An ignoramus would have been nonplussed and would have told you it is this, that, or the other. But I hit the nail on the head from the very first, and I tell you that your daughter is dumb. <laughs> yes, uh, but I should like you to tell me whence it arises. Nothing is easier. It arises from loss of speech. <laughs> yes. Well, very good. But the reason of her having lost her speech, pray? Our best authorities will tell you that it is because there is an impediment in the action of her tongue. But your opinion upon this impediment in the action of the tongue? Aristotle on the subject says, uh, a great many clever things. <laughs> yes. I dare say. Ah, he was a great man. No doubt. But to come back to our argument, I hold that this impediment in the action of her tongue is caused by certain humors. Inasmuch as the vapors formed by the exhalations of the influences which rise in the very region of diseases, coming, as us learned men say, Monsieur Geron, do you understand Latin? Not in the least. You do not understand Latin? No. <laughs> Cabricius Archithurum. Catalamus singularita nomovativo, arc musa de muse, bonus bona bonum. <laughs> oh, why didn't I study? It's so beautiful, I do not understand a word of it. <laughs> Thus these vapors, which I speak of passing from the left side, where the liver is, to the right side, where we find the heart, fill the ventricles of the omoplata. Now understand well this argument. Yes. Now, these vapors are endowed with a certain malignity, which is caused... Pay attention here, if you please. Uh, I do. <laughs> which is caused by the acridity of these humors engendered in the concavity of the diaphragm. And that is exactly the reason that your daughter is dumb. Oh, how well you speak. And it is undoubtedly impossible to argue better. Undoubtedly. Still, Monsieur Doctor, there's one thing I cannot exactly make out. Uh, that is the whereabouts of the liver and the heart. Hmm? Uh, it appears to me that you place them differently from what they are, that the heart is on the left side and the liver on the right. Yes, this was so formally, but we've changed all that. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, nowadays practice the medical art on an entirely new system. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, I pray you pardon my ignorance. There is no harm done. You are not obliged to be so clever as I. <laughs> Certainly not. But what think you, sir, ought to be done for my daughter's complaint? My advice is to put her to bed again and make her, as a remedy, take plenty of bread soaked in wine. Why so, sir? Because there is in bread and wine mixed together a sympathetic virtue which produces speech. Oh. see that they give nothing else to parrots and that by eating it they learn to speak oh that is true oh the great man quick plenty of bread and wine nurse hold a moment nurse come here what do you wish monsieur Geron? i must give some medicine to your nurse uh come with me nurse <laughs> me sir i'm as well as can be so much the worse nurse this excess of health is dangerous I must administer to you a certain little something. Uh, uh, administer to her later, monsieur. Now go, Jacqueline. Go, fetch the bread and wine. Uh, come with me, doctor. What are you going to do? What? Uh, give you your fee, sir. I shall not accept it, sir. What? Not at all. Oh, come now. Here. No, you are jesting. Indeed, I am not. Take it. I do not practice for money's sake. Oh, I'm convinced of that. Ah, uh, they have good weight. Oh, certainly. Now, take it. No, I am not a mercenary physician. Oh, I'm well aware of that. I'm not actuated by interest. I don't for a moment think so. Very well, then. I shall take it. <laughs> Only to please you, for I have nothing for you but affection. Oh, thank you. 
<laughs> I shall come back tonight, monsieur, to see how the patient is getting on. Good day. This now, ladies and gentlemen, is the courtyard outside Monsieur Geron's home. Scannerell, our fine physician, comes quickly out of Geron's house, crosses the courtyard and walks along the high stone wall, overgrown with vines and bushes. Behind some shrubs, he stops and glances round to see that no one is watching. Then, from out of his pocket, he takes the money Geron gave him for his services and counts same quite happy in his newfound profession. But suddenly a figure appears on top of the stone wall and sees Scannerell in his physician's gown. Hello! Scannerell looks up, sees a young man whom he has never seen before and quickly pockets his money. The young man leaps to the ground in front of Scannerell. Sir, I have been waiting to see you. Me? I have come to beg your assistance, Monsieur Doctor. Ah, my assistance. Give me your hand. Oh, but sir... Mm, That is a very bad pulse you have, young man. No, sir, I am not ill. What? You are not ill. Why the devil do you not tell me so? I am not ill. I wish to speak to you on another matter. My name is Leand. Who? Leand. I am in love with Lucine, to whom you have just paid a visit. And she is in love with me. As all access to her is denied to me through the ill temper of her father. Watch yourself. He is a rosy gentleman. (laughs) I beseech you, sir, to serve me in my love affair and to assist me in a stratagem that I have invented so as to say a few words to her. On this, my whole life and happiness depend. Whom do you take me for? How dare you address yourself to me to assist you in your love affair and to wish me to lower the dignity of a physician? Do not make such a noise, sir. I will make a noise. You are an impertinent fellow. Gently, sir. An ill-mannered jackanapes. Pray. I will teach you I am not the kind of man you take me for and that it is the greatest insolence. Sir? Hmm? I have here some coins of fine weight. Ah, you wish to employ me. Thank you. I was not speaking of you anyway, for you are a gentleman. (laughs) Now, uh, what is the affair in question? You must know then, sir, that this disease of Lucin's you wish to cure is a feigned complaint. Feigned? Ah, the physicians have argued about it, as they ought to do, and have not failed to give their opinion. This one that it arose from the brain, that one from the intestines, another from the spleen, another again from the liver. As my opinion, I have given none of these. My cleverness is so great. And you are right. For the fact is that love is its real cause. And Lucinde has only invented this illness in order to free herself from a marriage with which she has been harassed. Aha! The matter clears itself to me, Leander. Now come, sir. As we go along, I will tell you what I wish you to do. Yes, come, Leander. For somehow you have inspired in me an inconceivable interest in your love. You are kind, sir. And if all my medical science does not fail me, the patient shall either die or be yours. As you can see, a way back in 1666, money made the difference. How wonderful it is that things have progressed so. <laughs> well, arm in arm, Monsieur Scannerell and his new friend Leand leave Monsieur Geron's courtyard and walk into the field beyond, there to plot, if possible, a happy conclusion for the problems of young love. The end, Act Two. <laughs> This Wednesday night, don't miss screen star Melvin Douglas in Lost Weekend on your Playhouse on Broadway. In fiction and on film, the story of Lost Weekend gripped the public's imagination. Hear it adapted for your Playhouse on Broadway over most of these same stations this Wednesday night with Melvin Douglas in the starring role of the tragic victim of alcoholism. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network. Now we return to the Summer Theater as the curtain rises on Act Three of The Physician in Spite of Himself, starring Mr. Robert Young as Scannerell. This is your narrator again, ladies and gentlemen, anxious to get on with the third and final act of Moliere's The Physician in Spite of Himself. 
We left our hero, the honored and honorable physician, Scannerell, plotting with young Leon, plotting a scheme they hoped would bring Leon and Lucinde, the two young lovers, together. Now two hours have passed. The scene before us is a street behind Monsieur Gerant's house. Two men stand huddled there. One we recognize immediately, Scannerell, dressed still in his physician's gown and black pointed hat. The other is dressed in the clothes of an apothecary. Now in 1666, all pharmacists were called apothecaries, and I'm sure I really don't know why. But apothecaries, they were called, and so that's what we shall have to call this pharmacist. Now, on closer look, we can make out the identity of this pharmacist. <laughs> Pardon the apothecary. He is none other than Leandre in disguise. Leandre speaks. I think that I am not at all badly got up for an apothecary. As Lucin's father has scarcely ever seen me, this change of dress and wig is likely enough to disguise me. There is no doubt of it. Only, Monsieur Doctor... I should like to know five or six big medical words to leaven my conversation with and to give me the air of a learned man. Go along, go along. It is not at all necessary. The dress is sufficient, and I know no more about it than you do. How's that? The devil take me if I understand anything about medicine. You are a gentleman, and I do not mind confiding in you as you have confided in me. What? Then you are not really... No, a... I tell you. They have made me a physician in the teeth of my protests. I do not know how the idea came to them, but when I saw that in spite of everything they would have me a physician, I made up my mind to be so. I see some wisdom there. Why, sir, I am now resolved to stick to the profession all my life. Best trade of all. <laughs> the material we have to come and ship farthing. <laughs> it's costing us. Well, come now, Leander, we are ready. Let us go to the house of your lady love. There's a room in Monsieur Geron's house. Spent earlier. There is Mr. Mandir. Same beautiful thoughts, Leon. And there be subscription. The door opens and interest in his physician's gown. And so physician. I've been inquired here to see your daughter. I see you have given her the bread soaked in wine as I prescribed. The bread soaked in wine as I prescribed. Well, at least somewhat worse. Is the patient? I will wait and make it all right. Patient, you have given her. But you are right. Do not make yourself uneasy. His name? Shh. You undoubtedly feel her pulse so that I may consult with you. Pay duty, monsieur. I shall do. Monsieur Apothecary, and with great effect to discuss with you. But I should no, like... No, do not seek. Pay attention, pray. Eyes up. Is it among physicians to know whether women are congruity of the opaque humors? Change my... What's that? No, again. Excellent physician, how deep I... I have recovered my speech. So but Horace, but nothing will shake the resolution I have taken. What? All your fine arguments. Tell me. If... All your talking with heart can it submit to this tyranny? Oh... <laughs> Teach you, Dr. Scannerell, make her dumb again. <laughs> that is impossible. All of death. <laughs> I thank you. Lucinde, my daughter. No. All your reasoning will not have the slightest effect on me. You shall marry Horace this very evening. I would sooner marry death itself. Stop, for heaven's sake, stop. Monsieur Joron, let me doctor this matter. It is a disease that has got hold of your daughter, and I know the remedy to apply to it. Is it possible indeed, sir, that you can cure this disease of the mind also? Yes, let me manage it. I have remedies for everything, and our apothecary will serve us capitally for this cure. Monsieur Apothecary, a word with you, please. Yes, Monsieur Physician. You perceive, sir, that the passion Lucin has for this certain Leander is altogether against the wishes of her father. Yes, that seems apparent. So there is no time to lose. The humors are very acrimonious. Exceptionally acrimonious. So it is necessary to find speedily a remedy for this complaint, which may get worse by delay. As for myself, I see but one. Now listen. Yes? A dose of purgative flight. Purgative flight. I shall make a note. Mixed as it should be with two drachms of matrimonium. Ah, yes, matrimonium, a highly scientific compound. She may make some difficulty about taking this remedy, but as you are a clever man in your profession, you must induce her to consent to it and make her swallow the best thing you can. I know my task, Monsieur Physician. Now go, Monsieur Apothecary. 
Take a little turn in the garden with the patient to prepare the humors while I converse with her father. Come, Mistress Lucin. Above all, Monsieur Apothecary, lose not a moment. Apply the remedy quick. Apply the specific. I shall do the utmost to perform my duty. Mistress Lucin. An excellent scientific fellow, Monsieur Geron. He will take good care of your daughter. Uh, but, sir, what drugs are these you mention? Purgative flight, drachms of matrimonium. It seems to me I've never heard of them before. Uh, they are drugs which are used only in urgent cases. I trust they will prove their worth. <laughs> you would not believe how she is infatuated with this Leand. The moment I discovered this passion, I took measures to prevent the slightest communication between them. You have acted wisely. They would have committed some folly if they had been permitted to see each other. Undoubtedly. I think she would have been the girl to run away with him. Just so. I was informed that he tried every means to get speech with her. The rascal. But he will waste his time. I, I... I will effectively prevent him from seeing her. Ah, he has no fool to deal with when he deals with you, Monsieur Geron. <laughs> oh, no. One must get up very early to catch you asleep. Oh, oh indeed. <laughs> So Scannerelle slaps Monsieur Geraint on the back with a little more force, perhaps, than necessary, and congratulates him on his obvious wisdom. Monsieur Geraint smiles, even laughs out loud, but with becoming modesty. And now suddenly the door flies open, and Monsieur Geraint's servant, Lucas, rushes into the room. Monsieur Geraint! Monsieur Geraint! His face white with worry, he approaches Geraint and Scannerelle. Ah, Monsieur Geraint. Well, well, what is it, Lucas? Oh, hearts, Bob, sir, here is a pretty to-do. A pretty to-do? <laughs> what? What? Oh, your daughter, sir. She's fled with her Leon. What? It was Leon who played the apothecary. And this was the physician who performed the nice operation. <clears throat> well, uh, what? To murder me in this manner? Quick, Lucas, fetch a magistrate. Yes, Monsieur Median. Ah, villain, I will have you punished by the law. But you will be hanged. But do not stir a step, I tell you, for you are for the noose. And now, through the open door, comes someone else. Martine, Scannerelle's darling and devoted wife the one who first thought up her malicious revenge. Martine, too, is excited and somewhat weary, for she has been spending some long hours trying to track down her husband. Oh, good gracious, what a difficulty I had to find this place. Just tell me, what has become of the physician who... Ah! Here he is, just going to be hanged. What? My husband hanged? Alas, and for what? He has helped someone to run away with my daughter. Alas, my dear husband, is it true you are going to be hanged? Judge for yourself, wife. <laughs> <laughs> and must you be made an end of in the presence of such a crowd? What am I to do? If you had only finished cutting our wood, I should be somewhat consoled. <laughs> Leave me, you break my heart. No. <laughs> no, I will remain to encourage you to die. And I will not leave you until I have seen you hanged. <laughs> Thank you, wife. Which shall be very soon. The magistrate will be here directly. Monsieur Geron, alas, will not a few strokes of the cudgel do instead of hanging? No, no, the law shall decide, and hanging it will be if I have my way. But... But what's this do I see? And what Monsieur Geraint sees is the return of Leandre and the beautiful Lucien. Yes, the young lovers have come back, and Leandre, stripped of his apothecary's disguise, holds his beloved's hand tightly as he approaches her puzzled father. What is this? Monsieur Geraint, I appear before you now not as an apothecary, but as Leandre and am come to restore Lucine to your authority. Well, We intended to run away and get married, but this design has given way to more honorable proceedings. I will not presume to steal your daughter, and it is from your hands alone that I will obtain her. 
I must at the same time acquaint you that I have just now received some letters informing me of the death of my uncle and that he has left me heir to all his property. Oh. Ah, uh, really, sir, your virtue is worthy of my utmost consideration, and I give you my daughter with the greatest pleasure in the world. Oh, Leon. Lucinda. Odd sniggers, the physician has had a narrow escape. <laughs> Since you are not going to be hanged, husband, you may thank me for you being a physician. I have procured you this honor. Yes, it is you who procured me. I do not know how many thwacks with a cudgel. Oh. Monsieur Scannerell, the result has proved too happy to harbor any resentment. Be it so, Monsieur Leandre. Well, wife... I forgive you the blows on account of the dignity to which you have elevated me. But prepare yourself henceforth to behave with great respect towards a man of my consequence. And consider that the anger of a physician is more to be dreaded than people imagine. The players now turn to the audience and bow in unison all very happy that the letters arrived in time to tell Leandre of his inheritance. And not a moment too soon either. For if Leandre's uncle hadn't died just when he did, there's no telling what would have happened. But die he nicely did, and all is well. <laughs> the end, act three, the physician in spite of himself. And now, once again, here is our star, Mr. Robert Young. <laughs> Don, I'm wondering if you'd ask if there are any doctors in the house. <laughs> <laughs> well, doctors, uh, wouldn't one be enough, Bob? Uh, you don't look very ill. Well, it's not for me, Don. I was just thinking perhaps we should point out that the physician in tonight's play was not intended to portray any present-day doctor. Oh, uh, I don't know, Bob. Now, take my doctor, for instance. Don't say it, Don. He may be listening. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, Moliere's purpose in this play and in other of his plays was really a high-minded one. Satire and comedy was his method of pointing out and criticizing dishonesty, malpractice, insincerity, and all the other evils of his time. In short, there was a method in his madness. Making fun of people was his way of being constructive and promoting the public good. Well, I'm sure our audience will understand that now, Bob, and thank you very much for being with us tonight. It was a pleasure. Good night, everybody. Tonight, you have heard Moliere's classic play, The Physician in Spite of Himself, specially adapted for the Summer Theater by Lawrence Roman, starring Mr. Robert Young. Featured in the cast were Doris Singleton as Lucinde, Edgar Barrier as Reron, Shirley Mitchell as Martine, Vic Perrin as Leandre, with Eve McVeigh as Jacqueline, Lawrence Dobkin as Lucas, Jack Crucian as Valère, and Harry Bartell as Robert. Polly Bear was the narrator. Our producer-director is Norman MacDonald. Robert Young, star of Father Knows Best, appeared through the courtesy of the General Foods Corporation. And now this is your host, Don Wilson, reminding you to be with us again next week at this same time when the Summer Theater will present Daphne du Maurier's terrifying tale, The Birds. And our star will be Mr. Herbert Marshall. This is the CBS Radio Network.